we're going to talk about a very basic concept in DDS called domains and the ID that is used to identify domains. A DDS domain is configured with an integer called the domain ID. This is a non-negative integer with a default range of 0 to 232. Why 232? Well, we'll find out in another slide. But what's important right now is that when you create a domain ID, uh, sorry, when you create a domain participant, you will assign it a domain ID. Uh, once it's created, you can't change that domain ID. So a domain participant will only talk in the domain in which it was created. In a system, um, you may have multiple DDS domains. You may need, you may want to have multiple DDS domains, and there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, one is you might want to isolate applications from each other. These applications never should exchange data while the system is running. So uh, in that case, they may be, you should put them in different DDS domains. Um, you may want to uh, have private and protected data streams separated from your external data streams. So if you're using DDS to build a small subsystem, you may have a DDS domain for the internal data, as well as an external domain to integrate with other subsystems. DDS domains allow you to uh, basically share multiple systems, run multiple systems on the same physical network without the systems talking to each other in the case that you don't want them don't want them to talk to each other. Uh, this is very similar to like the ability to uh, create VLANs, okay, virtual uh, LAN networks on a physical LAN. So when you use different domain IDs, it uh, allows you to run perhaps multiple instances of the same system uh, on a network, maybe for development or testing, and you're assured that the systems don't actually interact with each other. And uh, another important reason that uh, multiple domains may be used is that you may be using different networks, okay, in which QoS settings uh, just aren't appropriate. You may be, one of your networks may be a satellite communication, which is a very lossy, very latent, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time to get data over that satellite communication network, and also very expensive to use. And then you have, uh, you know, a fast internal network, um, and if you had a domain participant trying to use both networks at the same time, it's uh, very hard to configure, actually, uh, because you know it has to treat the data differently. So instead, what you use is two different domains. One domain that exclusively uses perhaps the satellite link, and another domain that exclusively uh, talks inside uh, of a subnet that's really fast. And then this allows you to more easily um, manage how the data is uh, uh, passed over those two networks. So, more about the DDS domain ID. Well, DDS uses the domain ID to map the I, uh, to create ports, okay? So, uh, ports are basically a value that's part of your address, okay? So, when you're sending data to, for example, an, a UDP address, you also, not just sending it to an address, you have to send it, uh, you have to be a port. It's like uh, you have an apartment building, right? The apartment building has an address on the street, but you need to send it to a specific apartment, okay? So you need to have an apartment number. So if you um, send data to a specific UDP address, you still need to add this value called the port. Now, what port does DDS use? Uh, well, this is actually controlled by the domain ID, and the port mapping is actually specified by the DDS RTPS specification because you need to be interoperable. The ports that DDS RTI connects DDS uses has to be the same ports that other implementations of DDS, um, the other DDS implementations use so that those um, these two different DDSs can actually talk to each other. Now, there are different ports used for unicast data versus multicast data. There's also different ports used for uh, the category of user data versus discovery data. Okay, so there's actually, uh, you know, basically four different types of ports, uh, user data, unicast, user data, multicast, discovery data or metadata unicast, metadata multicast. And like I said, the ports are based on the domain ID as well as what is known as a participant index. And the index is something that's usually automatically calculated for you. It's automatically starts at zero for the first application or the first participant that you create on a host. And then it'll be automatically incremented one if you're the second participant that's been created on the host uh, and so on. Now, 
the maximum port for UDP or TCP connection uh, in IPv4 is 65535. Okay, so that's the largest port value that you can have. So there's a practical limit on the maximum domain ID via the domain mapping. Again, the port mapping is defined by a specification. There's an equation um, that uh, uh, is documented that you can uh, find out from our documentation as well as on the network. Um, and then what you find out is if the domain ID is 232 or less, then the ports won't exceed the maximum port value for UDP. Okay, If you create a domain ID of 233, then the port that the mapping equation uses, it's actually going to exceed the maximum possible value for UDP TCP port. Um, there's also an uh, associated restriction. Only 120 domain participants are can be created in the same domain on the same host. Okay, we're talking about on the same host. You can have thousands. Uh, there, there's no actual, uh, there's no uh, theoretical restriction on the number of domain participants in a domain as long as they're on different hosts. But within the same host, because the host only has a certain number of ports, um, up to 65535 ports, uh, then you can't actually have that many domain participants. So if you look at the port mapping, it pretty much restricts you to having the maximum number of domain participants in a, in a single domain of about 120, not about exactly 120. So um, now this mapping has been standardized, okay? But there are cases in which perhaps you want to have domain IDs that exceed 232, or maybe you want to have more than 120 domain participants of the same domain on the same host, in which case you're going to have to configure a non-standard mapping. And that can be done via the wire protocol QoS, specifically the RTPS well-known ports uh, parameters. Domain participants are the fundamental objects in DDS. Okay, it is the main DDS object for applications when you're using DDS. Uh, it's similar uh, in concept to like uh, sockets. If the um, if your application is using a UDP or TCP, uh, the first thing you need to do is create a UDP or TCP socket. Well, if you're using DDS, the first thing you need to do is create a domain participant. However, uh, when you create a domain participant, um, it's not just creating an object. When you create a domain participant, before the domain participant creation process uh, returns you a domain participant object, it will have allocated a lot of internal memory, uh, things like mutexes and shirt and semaphores. Uh, it will spawn internal threads to do the work of a domain participant. It will instant transport plugins. It will create sockets, shared memory segments. Um, and it will start trying to discover other applica applications on the network by sending out uh, data P announcement, basically network packets. So creating domain participant is a heavyweight process. We call it a heavyweight process. It, it's going to consume CPU. It's going to start using up network traffic. It's going to consume memory. Deleting a domain participant is similarly heavyweight. Um, it, it's going to send out discovery traffic telling everyone else that it's being deleted. It's going to start uh, stop, basically, uh, the, the internal threads. It's going to deallocate memory. So deleting and creating, uh, creating and deleting domain participants isn't something that you typically do uh, dynamically during system operation unless you're starting and stopping an application. So if an application is continuously running, you usually create a domain participant or domain participants that you want to use uh, when the application is created and you only just delete them when you shut down your application. It's not saying that you can't do it. I mean, you could dynamically create and delete domain participants, but know that it's a pretty heavyweight process. It will, um, it, it'll be, it'll represent a spike in your CPU consumption, uh, perhaps a spike on the network in terms of network traffic being used. So you have to uh, weigh that against your requirements and how your system is supposed to behave. Now, when you do have different uh, DDS domains, this uh, allows you to create basically virtual data buses on the same physical network, uh, similar to VLANs on the same LAN, okay? So here we have three domains, domain zero, one, and two, and applications in a domain will only talk to applications in their domain because they never discover an application 
outside of their domain. So here we have applications one, two, and three in domain zero, one, two, three in domain one, app, app one, two, three in domain two. They may be the same application. Application ones, maybe it's the same application run multiple times, except when you start them, you just give it a different DDS domain ID when you start them. Now, typically, um, if they start them in the same domain, they'll all discover each other and all start exchanging information. But if you start them in different domains, they will never discover each other because you never discover somebody who is not in your domain. You, Because of this, you also never exchange data okay, or any packets at all between applications that are in different domains. Um, like I said, it's, it's like creating virtual data buses on the same physical network, and an analogy is the VLANs. And what it kind of uh, enables you to do is allows you to have different developers Okay, you have developers kind of doing their own part of the system, but then when they need to test their system, um, they can uh, get the, run their tests, okay, sharing the same uh, network, but making sure that their test isn't interfering with other people's tests. Okay, so if I'm running a test, I don't want to all of a sudden be receiving data from somebody else or, or uh, you know, having my data uh, interfere with somebody else's tests. So, for example, at RTI, what we do is every developer is assigned a different domain ID. Okay, so uh, as a developer, you when you're supposed to when you run your test, you're going to run on a domain ID that no one else is using. Of course, we will have shared domain IDs for when we're doing uh, you know combined tests or system level tests where the entire system is being tested. But this really allows you to um, you know not have to create you know, different physical networks just to do development and testing. So, um, in an operational system, you may want to have multiple domains, okay? And uh, I spoke about this earlier. When you create subsystems, the subsystems may actually use DDS internally. So, I have a subsystem A and subsystem B. And in subsystem A, it's got three applications. System B has three different applications. And they're actually using DDS to talk between those applications. As a system integrator, I'm also going to use DDS to talk between system A and B. But A has some internal data that B shouldn't access. And B has some internal data that A shouldn't access. So one way to do this is to use uh, different DDS domains. Um, a domain for internal data, a domain for external data. So domain zero is internal to subsystem A, domain one is internal to subsystem B, and then we'll use domain two to talk. What this does mean, of course, is that applications can be in multiple subsystems, or sorry, multiple domains at the same time. Um, applications can be in multiple domains by creating multiple participants in different domains. So here, application three and application four are the ones that actually talk to each other uh, through the external domain two. And so therefore, application three will create a participant in domain zero and domain two, and application four will create a participant in domain one and domain two. Now, sometimes you're running a DDS uh, or running a system in which you have different networks connected and these networks can be very different in terms of their throughput in terms of their bandwidth um, in terms of their reliability uh, here's an example where i have a local system uh, that talk uh, to each other that use dds to talk to each other and they're also going to use dds to talk over satellite link okay now the characteristics of sending data over satellite link is very different the quality of service that you need to use to send data over a satellite link is very different than perhaps on a local area network that's very fast. So if you want to simultaneously use networks that are very different, uh, it requires different transport plugin configurations. So you may want to use UDP to send data over the satellite link and the internal link. Well, it's tremendously hard to configure UDP uh, to be different uh, in the same participant. It's possible, but it's, uh, you know, it's complicated. So what you can do is use a different QS profile, okay, for the same data on different networks by using different domain participants. So you use one QS profile to program one domain. You'll use a different QS profile when talking on a different, another domain. In summary, uh, DDS domains are identified by an integer 
call the domain ID. That's uh, non-negative. Uh, the largest practical DDS domain is 232. It's uh, controlled by the standard and the constraint of a, the, of the largest or the maximum value that you can have for a UDP port. Um, but the largest practical value is 232. Domain participants created with a domain ID will only communicate with other participants with the same ID. Um, they will only discover other participants with the same ID. They will only exchange network packets with participants uh, with the same ID. However, applications can actually communicate in multiple DDS domains if they create multiple participants with different domain IDs. And finally, um, it's usually not the best practice to uh, destroy and create and recreate and, re and redestroy domain participants during operation unless you are actually shutting down uh, the application and restarting the application. If your application's uh, up and running the entire time, uh, the best practice is to create domain participants when you start the application and only destroy them when you shut down the application.